Ah, oh, boo, I think I did it too early. No. Huh. Oh, okay. I have to change my names. I'll change their names afterwards. That works. Fine. Fine, fine, fine. Okay. My names are reversed. I have to go and fix that afterwards. All right. So, the one of the things you guys might have noticed about contract one is that you learn a bunch of really interesting things. You learn about how contracts are formed and sort of the nature or makeup of what a contract is, but it doesn't really tell you what you're supposed to do in relation to contracts. We don't really learn a lot about how the law actually operates. And most importantly, when you're in a contract, how can you get out of it and try to somehow dodge or bypass your obligations or possibly stop somebody who else is trying to bypass or dodge their obligations? And assuming that there is a valid contract, what do the sides actually have to do and what are the consequences for that? I said, it's been a long time since I've taught contracts uh, two, uh, many years, so I said eight years, but I have been teaching a variety of subjects uh, in the business school, um, both Neil Dunbar's stage one business law subject that some of you guys may or may not have done or be doing now, and more recently in the MBA space. So I teach the MBA students their sort of general purpose business law subject. And basically the uh, MBA students essentially take contract one and contract two and condense it basically down to about five weeks of their single semester. Um, so it's the same stuff, just squished uh, and not done in the same level of depth. But I, I again go through when I'm explaining this to them that really the, the four sort of components to this that we have is the formation of contracts, bringing contracts together, creating them. And Rachel would have gone over that for the first sort of five or six weeks, not longer, in contract one. And then looking at Okay, assuming that there is a contract, what, is the, what do the parties have to do? And those are the terms, uh, that stuff, in terms of what our obligations actually are. And that takes an entire semester for you guys, because when you're solicitors, you need to know those concepts in much more depth. Um, this subject is about those last two things. The vitiating factors, so some forms of defect that somehow prevents there being some sort of meeting of minds between the parties. Um, and we'll, we'll be doing that for the next four or five weeks, uh, both the common law positions and the positions in equity, as well as the statutory regime of the Australian Consumer Law and the Sale of Goods Act. Um, and it's important. This stuff is you know, very useful in terms of professional practice. And the reason for that is in life, People do horrible things to each other. They, uh, they lie, they bully, they coerce others into contracts, which on the face of it, and form and structure of a contract, seems to have all of those elements. Offer, intention, create legal relations, acceptance, capacity, consideration, uh, mutuality and legality. But there's some form of defect. And we use this term vitiating factors to really define and describe the defects that, um, that can occur in contracts. 
uh, as a result of some form of outside influence. And the second half of this semester is going to be about discharge. Uh, to obviously talk about that in much more depth. That is what happens to bring a contract to the end. So formation was about bringing them together. Terms is working out what's in there. Vitiating factors is about trying to see if there's some sort of defect in the way this has been put together. Um, and discharge is about breaking it apart uh, and seeing what the consequences are to the parties. Um, so as a result, in almost every scenario you get in this subject, you can assume there is a valid contract on the face of it. If you feel yourself writing a lot about the stuff from contract A, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, it's probably the first point just to know, particularly in terms of your assessment. If you're spending a lot of time going over the same stuff you've learned in contract A, you're probably missing the point. Um, and as a person now who's both you know, been a student and taught a lot of substantive law subjects, a, a tip for doing well in exams, or rather, I'm not a tip, more a warning, the single easiest way in law for not doing well in exams is missing the issues. You know, we talk about IRAC, identify the issue, explain the appropriate legal rule or principle, apply it, and then at the end we'll con you know, create some form of conclusion as a result. Give some advice usually. Am I going to jail? Um, how much am I going to have to pay? Uh, and so on. But missing that first step, and just and if you think about it in terms of us grading your work, if you miss that first step, you don't identify the issue, you can't do the other things either. And as a result, it can very, very strongly and very negatively impact um, you know, your, your result in terms of the assessment. And again, I'll go over a lot of this stuff more in tutorials, but just leave that in the back of your mind, that, um, that IRAC stuff, and that you won't need a lot of reference to the stuff that you got in contract one. Okay, but to be honest, all of these vitiating factors, it really actually goes to one of the elements of a, of a contract. Now, I'm not sure how Rachel would have expressed it. Some places, some courses express it in terms of seven elements. It's probably what you guys got. That certainly follows Steve Grohl's book, um, Offer Acceptance, Capacity, Consideration, Tenure, Legal Relations, Mutuality, and Legality. Probably. Does it sound familiar? Vague, vaguely, yeah, it's a nods. Oh, this is there. Which, which one? Yeah, something along those lines. Yeah, yeah it's a little bit better. I mean, would have been, what, five months ago for you guys. Um, really, it's about, for most of these vitiating facts, it's actually about the mutuality component. Um, it's the true meeting of minds. And so when we're kind of analyzing the vitiating factors, it's about trying to determine whether there was this actual real consent between the parties to enter into this contract as it's apparent or as it's formed. Um, because if there is some sort of defect, you can get something. And we will talk about a variety of these vitiating factors in terms of um, well, what they are and how they operate. But there are some things that are common to all of them. And so these, the things that we talk about, I've got a little list of them here. Um, six of them. And the first five are really to do with that, essentially targeting the mutuality aspect. The sixth one, which in my personal opinion is actually by far the hardest thing to do in this subject, um, is the illegality component. Um, but we've got a few weeks before that comes up. Now, just a little, something of a caveat. This is a substantive law subject. Right? You are learning things that for those that do end up in practice, actually going into the legal profession, practicing, and uh, the data suggests that 34%, so 34% of people starting, admittedly, you guys aren't the starting, well, we're, you've already got some amount of investment in getting um, structured legal education in order for you to seek uh, entry to the legal profession, but it's about 34% of people that start actually, I think within five years, are actually practicing. Um, or holding and using a uh, practicing certificate. But as a person, as Edda, who's done community legal for many years, I can tell you, hand on heart, that some of these come up a lot more than others. So while we have to learn them, and you'll, I guess, we'll you know, essentially place pretty much equal weight 
on the various Vichyan factors, Vichyan factors in terms of your assessment, because you need to demonstrate to us that you know and understand the concept of law. In practice, turns out people lie to each other way, 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 way more than the, all of these other things added together and multiplied by a factor of about 10. So that actual, actually in terms of practice, a misleading deceptive conduct and uh, to a very, very, very lesser extent, common law uh, misrepresentation are things that come up a lot more often than the others. So just leave that in the back of your mind. When we're offering uh, this many topics with this amount of time, uh, that's not a reflection, strictly speaking, of, of how much you're going to need or use them. Uh, but we do start with mistake. That'll be the, um, the remainder of this lecture today, and we'll talk about it, um, which is quite rare. Um, mistake is where one or both parties are somehow mistaken, for want of a better word, about something essential to a contract. And whether or not that's going to um, vitiate it, give some sort of remedy or some result as, um, as a consequence. Uh, misrepresentation, as I alluded to, is, is about lying. Question? Vitiating is undoing in some way. Mitigating is accepting that something is or something exists and reducing its impact in some way. And so that when we do the performance aspect, we talk about discharge by performance. The other, for example, this is, you'll do this, probably do this in about week nine. When one side of a contract is in breach, you know, we're the innocent side, the other side's in breach, all right? we're going to be able to sue them and get some money. All right? We actually are owe a duty at common law, though, to mitigate their loss, to reduce their loss by taking reasonable steps. So, for example, if um, I, I, I'm a seller of ice creams and, I'm, and you're a purchaser of ice creams to go and sell to a cruise ship, and if I drop these ice creams off and you call me up and say, no, 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 I can't pick them up today. Um, I can't pick them up today. Sorry, my car broke down. You're in breach because you didn't turn up, but I actually owe a duty at common law to mitigate that. What would reasonable steps be when I'm at the Strand with 50 boxes of ice creams? Go and sell them. Go and sell them for a dollar. Go and sell them for a dollar a box. It doesn't have, to, doesn't have to be, I don't have to mitigate all of your loss. You're in breach. That's mitigating. It's reducing it in some way. Um, vitiating factors usually, and I'll go through the different types and uh, remedies that are common amongst a bunch of them, are usually to try and undo a contract in some way, to somehow render it either void from the outset or give you the option to somehow undo this contract to try and put the parties back to where they were. Um, that's really what it is. Vitiate is to try and undo, nullify in some way. Did that help? Okay. Um, most of them is exactly as it sounds. It's where people lie and they can do it innocently and sometimes they can do it very fraudulently. Both of these things happen. There is a strong statutory regime for managing that but we, because we're doing this as future lawyers, um, we'll learn the common law rules first. And as you guys are aware, contract law in the state of Queensland and the Commonwealth of Australia is common law based, not based in statute. Um, I, teach, I, said, I teach in the MBA space. There are a lot of international students and they have a really hard time with that. They want to go and find where in your contract code does this rule apply? It's like, well, it doesn't. It's what's known as the unwritten law. It comes from judges' heads. Uh, duress is where some force, force in the world, is exerted on somebody, which isn't very nice. Um, buy my ice creams or I break your kneecaps. That type of, of yeah, it's tough, obviously that's a very, very simple, straightforward one, but uh, things can happen a lot more subtly than that, though. If you don't buy my ice creams, I'm going to tear up all of these other contracts with, um, uh, you know, that we have with you. Or I'm not going to hire... You know, your nephew, or doing things that we somehow consider to be illegitimate in order to, to achieve some particular result, usually getting somebody into a contract where it's not a true meeting of minds. Oddly, duress is actually a relatively recent phenomena in contract law. Um, used to be the courts were like, oh, well, you know, you got forced into this contract, so you, did, you, know, you went through, you did this contract, there'll be some other remedy you can do, probably in tort or something else, you know, the tort of deceit or the tort of assault threatening to bash your kneecaps or what hell have you. Um, undue influence and unconscionable conduct, you might have been exposed to that earlier. Did you, did you guys get exposed to Amadio's case in your first year, LA101? I can't remember. It's been a while since I've taught it. Um, nonetheless, 
these are in the area, the murky, murky, misty, foggy place known as equity. Equity, and I, again, I say this as a person who's having to teach both this semester, equity and administer of law are the two parts of law and our legal system that will differentiate you from lay people. Uh, the two parts, in my opinion, this is solely Simon Walker opinion, the two things you'll learn at law school that other people cannot learn in the scope of their lives. People can work out, you know, work out what a contract is. People know vaguely what a crime is. You, know, you hit someone over the head, they probably can work out you know, there's some sort of compensation. Um, but those are the areas, equity and administrative law, are the two areas that are actually quite opaque. Even the names. I mean, let's face it, if we didn't have the priestly 11, who here would have enrolled in a sub boring subject that called administrative law? How boring is that? Who would have enrolled in a subject called equity? Don't even know what that is and wouldn't care. It's so, so important in your legal training because this differentiates it's you guys um, from people who don't have that training. This is, it's really one of the hallmarks of becoming um, a legal practitioner, knowing these areas. So undue influence and unconscionable transactions um, are things that people, most people don't understand as well. It's not intuitive. <laughs> Illegality is kind of its own kettle of fish. Um, there's a variety of modes and methods that contracts can be rendered um, unlawful in, in terms of how they're performed, whether they're formed. Um, we'll go about that in a bit more depth. Um, that, sort of, that sort of sits alone. Um, because in many ways, the illegality, you know, legality is an element to a contract, as well as illegality we analyze as a vitiating factor, they're kind of the same thing. We just do it in more depth uh, in this next here. All right, so that list, um, leave them in the back of your mind, you're gonna need that list for the next four or five weeks. Okay, now they are different, they are different things, they have different elements. You guys know what the word element means? This is one thing, by the way, when I started doing law, um, I, I had the lovely Diane Rule, who's actually my solicitor as well. She's a family lawyer, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant lass. And she would start talking about elements. Dush, 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 dush. The elements of this and the other. What's an element? Does anyone actually stop to, to work out what does that word actually mean? It's um, because no one explained this in your first week of law school. An element is something that needs to be proved to the court conjunctively. It is a point of law that needs to be proved. It needs to be proved um, according to what, uh, by the person who has the onus to prove it, which can be in a civil manner, the person bringing the action, plaintiff, in a criminal matter, it's the crown, and they need to prove conjunctively. What does that mean? They must prove all of them. If you do not prove, for example, um, the tort of negligence. You have to prove that a duty of care exists. You have to prove that the defendant's conduct fell below the standard appropriate for that duty of care. And you have to prove that that falling below that standard caused your loss. You do not prove all three of those. You get nothing. Elements are conjunctive. You do not win unless you prove them all. I, again, I, did, I always smile sweetly when I'd read the the stage on business law students taught, talk about the tort of negligence where somebody's being sued for $100,000 and they say they proved the first two elements but not the third, so they only get $66,000. No, you get nothing. Worse than that, you pay the other guy's costs. Okay, so that's one thing. No, um, have you guys heard of the term limbs? Limbs are the opposite. Things that need to be proved disjunctively. Um, so, in fact, in this course, actually, we learned about the limbs of Hadley and Baxendale. Um, the, proving the, rem the, <laughs> the test for remoteness of damages in contract law. You prove one or the other. They're disjunctive. One or the other. Um, the limbs of 8-1 of the Income Tax Act. In order to deduct a particular item, it has to be either directly incurred as part of deriving income or necessarily incurred in the running of a business. Those are limbs, either or. Is this news to you guys? Or is this, does this kind of make sense? Because I just said it was a piece of information I just wish was told to me in my first week. Probably was. I wasn't paying attention. Right. Now, so vitiating factors, as we're teaching them, there are going to be common law actions and common law and equitable actions. They're going to be a series of elements. They have to be proved by one of the sides. 
in order to get some result. It's one of those curious things you find when you, you guys go out and you would start doing practice. Particularly, again, particularly doing things like community legal, when your friends, family come and ask you all sorts of questions, and they'll say, this person's done something bad. And you go, yep. And then there's this pause. And the pause is, well, so what? What do you want? What is the result? Or the more technical term, what is the remedy? In contract law, and particularly in terms of vitiating factors, um, some of the remedies uh, can be the same. Um, so, you know, uh, what's an example? Uh, mistake, for example. Um, we're talking talk about mistake today, and we can talk about that idea of going to the court, proving that mistake applies, that common mistake applies. The contract can be declared void by the judge, void ab initio, as if it never existed. That's one particular type of remedy that the common law allows in that particular set of circumstances. In other circumstances, such as innocent misrepresentation, they give you a right to avoid the contract. You get a right, for innocent misrepresentation is actually an equity, to go and undo the contract. And you do that usually by, if you've, um, if you've been sold a car, taking the car back to the person. Or sorry, if you've sold a car to somebody and it turns out the check was... Um, you weren't selling it to the party that you thought you were selling it to, for whatever reason. Um, you can get a right. Oh, on, that's not a very good example. Innocent misrepresentation. If they've made a representation to you when you've bought this car through the logbooks, it wasn't their fault. Neither of you could have checked it. You found out this thing. They've made a misrepresentation to you. You did get a right to undo the contract, but you have to do it quickly. You must actually take a step. It doesn't happen automatically. Whereas a contract, if co a common mistake is, is proved, it's void ab initio. There's no choice. Okay. Um, we'll come back to that Nemo Dat role. That's, that's an important role, but we'll talk about it when we start the mistake module. We should probably finish with the same. Uh, all right, two more slides on this one. What I'll do is I'll go through these slides. These apply to all vitiating factors, um, or rather, to the area of law known as vitiating factors, but some of the actions, you can get some of these remedies. And I'll go through and explain which ones can use which remedies, but when you're explaining them, the way you can explain it essentially operates the same for each of them. Um, and before I mentioned that undue influence, oh, is that font a little bit too small? I'm trying to work out with these because it's always hard to judge how big the font is, how big it's going to appear on the screen, how big the lecture room is, how good the eyesight of everybody is. It's a, a tricky things to judge. Um, we're not supposed to put too much information on, on slides. Folks, so people are just reading through them. Um, but just make note, it may seem like a small point at the start, and it probably is most of the time, particularly if you never actually end up in this area of law. Um, but knowing of these vitiating factors, which ones are common law, actions and which ones are in equity is actually an important distinction in terms of practical implications because equity is a discretionary set of discretionary remedies of the court this wasn't explained to me by the way when i was doing law or doing business in fact i've done many many law subjects this is a really important point equity is discretionary the judge can either give it to you or no or might not give it to you it must be done, though, in the courts themselves. Whereas the common law actions, if you reckon that common mistake applies, look, you could be wrong, don't get me wrong, you always be a little bit careful about that. Um, or if somebody's threatened to break your kneecaps unless you sign, you know, sign over your, your stuff, if, when that threat's gone, you think that you were going to go to court and win, just rock up and grab your stuff and take it back again. Um, it seems like a little bit of a, like I'm, I'm being flippant about this, but it's actually quite an important distinction here. You can never be sure of a result in equity, whereas common law things can be plain as day. And you have self-help remedies. You could just arrive, get your stuff, take it back again, particularly if title didn't pass, for things like common mistake. Um, so just make note, if somebody if thinks that their will has been overborne or that they were at some special disadvantage, 
and, um, and the other side knew about that disadvantage and actively sought to exploit it. These are equitable. These, these are remedies you can get, but they're inequity. You've got to go to court. Um, so just leave that one on the back of your mind. Okay. Uh, that last one, you guys will actually do an entire subject on equity and, and trust in your third year. Um, and they talk about the idea of damages. Damages is the technical term that we use. You've got to store that in your head now to mean money. Money that you get as an award from the court. Damages are money you get as an award from the court. It's more relevant in the final six weeks of the subject, um, but we will mention it from time to time over the next few weeks with uh, the sharing factors. All right. I've got one last slide here before I switch the, um, the stream over and we'll start on mistake. Um, and that is the, the reason why, first of all, when I say equity or the equitable remedies are discretionary, the courts can choose to give them or not give them. Things that they take into account are these sorts of factors. And these sorts of factors are taken into account when all um, of the situations where you're trying to seek a remedy and equity. Uh, if you take too long to go to the courts, when we say too long, this is not a fixed point in time. Depends how big the thing is, how much opportunity you had to undo it, um, whether or not society would think that it, you took too long to go through and undo this contract. Um, ratification, if you'd actually gone through and upheld the contract as if it were good for a long period of time, um, you can't get a remedy in equity. Um, the unclean hands doc doctrine is, uh, is interesting. Basically, if you're trying to screw them over and they're trying to screw you over and then one of you goes to try and seek remedy and equity, the courts just go, nah, nah, you're both little rat bags. We're not gonna, we're not gonna get involved here, here. You're both acting in bad conscience. The doctrine of clean hands applies. Look, to be honest, um, I don't go into too much depth. No, not for, for this subject, but it's a little bit funny. The English apply this very strictly. In Australia, land of convicts, uh, they don't apply it quite as strictly. You can get away with all sorts of things. Um, if you sort of repent, for want of a better word, go back, repay the money to Centrelink that you were trying to rip off, go and pay the stamp duty that you were trying to avoid and such like. They do, do let you get around that a little bit. Um, equity also won't generally um, do anything impacting third parties. It's, a, you know, it's about this court of conscience and third parties that aren't involved in the transaction. It's not in good conscience for anyone, for them to somehow suffer as a result of things that have happened between two others or two unrelated per persons. Um, and so that's that idea and this bona fide third party's person. So if you, for example, um, if uh, for innocent misrepresentation, there's a right to rescind, but if the, if the goods have gone or been unsold to a third party and they've paid for that, then you lose that right in equity to undo that contract. Um, because of the paying money back, which one? The oh, restitution should become impossible. Um, if for whatever reason, the equity won't do anything which is pointless. So getting an order for somebody to pay back money in equity or to make them um, offer some sort of specific performance in order to return um, goods of some sort, if those goods have been destroyed, or if this person's got no money, the courts won't actually grant an order, because they will at common law. So a person being bankrupt is not a reason for you to fail at common law, it is an equity. Okay. Right, I'm gonna end that slide there. I'm gonna start on the mistake. So again, it's, look, I'm, I'm actually kind of doing this consciously. We're trying to break this up in terms of topics, rather than just having one hour, two hour, uh, lecture. So if, if it's all right with you guys, which we'll is, I'll take a couple of minutes, I'll switch the slides over. It's like changing the film in a, one of those old cinema things. I'll go through and do that, and then I'll start, we'll go through the first of the Vichyang factors, which is mistake, and we should spend about just under an hour on that. Okay? Thank you. This is the bit where you can talk if you want to. Thanks. <coughs>